Okay, so mm, can you hear me? You can hear me, more or less. If you uh, if you don't hear me, then too bad. <laughs> oh, well, so uh, so thanks for coming for to, to to my talk, which is the last talk of the of the day. So your endurance is high <laughs> to microservices talks. And to, to to begin with, I would like to oh no, I turned it off. Is it on? Yeah, it is. So uh, let me introduce myself. I hope to be rather brief because everybody wants to go to the party. I'm Maciej Bruchniak and some, some time ago as I was algebraic topologist and I was involved in P-local compact groups. By the way, in Barcelona you have a really strong research group connected with P-local compact groups. So if you want to change the discipline, then it's a great place to be. But a few years ago I've moved on to more vulgar things like this. So now I'm working in... I used to say small agile software house, but somebody told me that if we have 80 people, then it means that we are no longer so small. Anyway, we are really agile and we are specialized in, you know, impossible deadline kamikaze projects. So if you, if, if so you have a project that has two months deadline and the project is estimated to be six months, then call us. On the other hand, if you have six months deadline for a six month project, then probably we, we would wait four months doing nothing until we reach certain level of motivation. So we're doing mainly integration, also some more specific things like secure Scala and so on. And today, well, I came here just like many people in this conference to talk to you about microservices, the most hip thing in the IT since AJBs and core bands, stuff like that. So I do believe that if you put three out of uh, these things in your abstract, you'll get accepted to any conference in the world, right? But for me, uh, unfortunately, this is not the case, so we'll have to move on. So, so, so about the microservices, I'm sure that uh, after, after the, this day you know everything about them, but it's more or less like this. You have to decompose your system to, to, to some smaller parts that are around some business capabilities, you deploy them independently, they talk to each other, these are of course loosely coupled interactions, nothing to, to get worried about. And, you know, you, you reach some level when you have all unicorns running around and you're really, really happy. So, but, but in fact, what microservices promise you to give is this. They are easy to understand because the code base is small. They are easy to change because the code base is small. They are easy to scale because you deploy them independently. You can scale with all those load balancers, caproxies, engines, Kubernetes, and stuff like that. And because they are separated, they have separated code bases, you can use different languages, stacks, Node.js, Haskell, and everything like that. And also, because they are, again, deployed independently, this is, you have resilience, fault tolerance. Of course, you, if you do them properly without mm, tightly coupling, coupling things like RPC HTTP calls, like most people do. Okay? So, uh, at, the at our company, we are trying to be modern and innovative and hip. So now when, when people hear that in the project there won't be any Docker and Mesos, they say suckers. I don't want to be on that project. So when we reached the point when we had to write quite a big system, we of course considered using microservices. Unfortunately, you have to be reach a certain level of well tallness to be able to do microservices. I encourage you to, to find an article by Martin Fowler about what it <coughs> takes to, to be successful at microservices. In short term, it amounts to this. You should be able to do DevOps and you should be able to do continuous delivery. If you can't do this, then microservices might not be a good place for you. And what about our case? Well, it was fairly large code base. It was already kind of modular, more than 200 or 300 jars in, in many servers in different locations. Nobody quite controlled <laughs> who they are. It took like seven years of the development to do this, so most of the code was like yeah, older libraries, uh, old Java 5 from IBM and stuff like that. And on this platform, because it was kind of integration platform, there was like four vendors about. We are the main one and the best one, of course. But there were also other who couldn't code that good as we. And one client, client one big telco company from Poland. In fact, we usually work for big telcos in Poland. But we strive to, to, to find a different customer. 
So the problem of our client was that they considered themselves to be a mature organization. They used to be more agile, but now they want to be mature. And what does it mean to be mature IT? Well, it means you have release management, no continuous delivery, no whatsoever. And also, you want to separate your development from operations. Right? So, in fact, some times ago they almost had DevOps, but now they are mature, they want to separate development and operations. So, yeah, <laughs> that was, that was not a good place to start with microservices, put Docker and, and stuff like that. Because it, it quickly, we quickly realized that in, in their ops step, there are two people to, with permissions to create virtual machines. One was on holiday, and everyone was very busy, so it took like, I don't know, two weeks to provision us with one virtual machine. Because when physical server, it took like a month or two months, something like that. So again, mm, we found that microservices maybe are not the way to go. Because we are, instead of progressing, they, our client kind of regressed. And what's more, there were also some cultural problems. For example, when you have big enterprise, you have mm, mm, some power struggles because between business owners. For example, we, uh, we had two modules uh, developed by two teams at Talk, at my company, but they were owned by two separate people uh, uh, in our client's enterprise, and they didn't like each other. So while we could agree very quickly about interfaces, how to change the data and so on, they quarreled and they didn't want to reach agreement. So what do you do when you have such such situation, of course, you introduce integration layer and everything gets even more complicated. So what I'm talking about is more or less example of Conway's law, right? That which states more or less that organization which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of communication structures of this organization. I, I'm sure it's too late to, to, to fully understand what it's all about, but if, if we were in Agile conference, then probably I would tell you how to transform your uh, organization to, yeah, to, 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 to have better communication structures and so on. But we are not at Agile conference, for sure. <laughs> I mean, not, not the soft skills. So we have to cope with it some, somewhat differently. And in fact, if you think about it, about typical ecosystem at big enterprise, it's, they have certain reasons to behave like they behave. It, it has something to do with who owns the code, who owns the middleware, who owns the infrastructure. Because most of the successful uh, microservices stories are about product companies that have in-house development. Just like we talked before, right? The guys uh, were developing their product and it, all the code was developed by them. So they own infrastructure, middleware and applications. But in typical vendor ecosystem, they are the ops guys in, in the enterprise, there are some middleware, well, middleware, sorry, vendors, and there are vendors of applications. So it's kind of blurry who controls what, and probably the enterprise won't let the vendors control the infrastructure, because they want to have control over their infrastructure, and for a good reason, because it's kind of a tricky thing, it's, you know, all the legal stuff, security, and so on, and the vendors come and go, so it's natural for them to have their own operations team and not to let the vendors control it. So again, a reason not to try to introduce Kubernetes, Docker, and, and stuff. At least not, not today. Hopefully it, uh, things will change. So what are the choices in, your, in, in such a situation? First is, have, is to try to find powerful ally. Unfortunately, our own, we don't have CEO in our company and our owners don't play golf. So we couldn't find an ally in the enterprise because yeah, nobody seriously would like to talk to us. And the other way is to change job. And that's also a very good way. My friend successfully tried it. He left, he, he went to product company, and now he's happy developing microservices in Ruby and stuff like that. Oh, and then the third worst solution. Sit down and think, what can we achieve? How can we survive? let's say, because it's not about microservices, it's about all these benefits. And we just have to, you know, 
cope with the thing that we won't have good microservices structure, just like classical, like with Netflix, one or Google, or stuff like that. We have to be somewhat more modest. And what what is it all about? Well, it's basically about writing modular applications. <laughs> what does it mean to build for applications to be modular? Well, if you think about it, it's there are different levels of modularity. First is modular development. You separate your code into packages, you separate your projects into different maybe some modules and so on and so on. Then it's modular packaging. Either you put your all your uh, artifacts in one, one single var or er or something like that, or you put it into different different uh, container structures. And the second is modular deployment. That's the real physical um, containers that, that contain your artifacts. So on, on the pictures, look like this. If you have modularity on code level, then your packages are separate, but you package it into one artifact, and then you deploy it on separate server. And classical microservice architecture is like this. Everything is separated. The code, the packaging, and the deployment. So what we tried to end up with, and we, I would say, somewhat even succeeded, was trying to do this. Modularity on code level, modularity on package level, because this is the piece that we control, we developers, and then run it in, well, not one, but fewer containers. Because this is the part that we have less control. This is the ops guys part. <laughs> so how, how can we do it? Well, we can use Java. If you are old enough, you, you surely know all this bullshit, right? <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's forget about it. But now, in fact, it's partially true, right? Because you can do polygon programming with Java. It's, you can use Java, Scala, Ruby, Natural, and yeah, probably nobody in the enterprise would like to use these languages. <laughs> but, but still, you can do polygon. Programming, but what about modularity in Java? Well, there is Project Jigsaw, there is Java 9. Who of you believe that it will come in Java 9 next year? Yeah, believer. I don't believe. It's like waiting. I think it's like waiting for God, and and I think it's kind of for a good reason. Why? Because there is there is an effort to put modularity to Java. It's called SGI. Haha, <laughs> oh come on. So, so tell me, how many of you would come here if I would put in my title to mm, microservices with SGI? <laughs> yeah, that's the point. That's why I didn't do it. But you are here, so maybe you won't laugh. You won't leave, sorry. <laughs> so, so what's SGI? It's a set of standards that's almost, I think, 18 years old. It has some static parts. The, the part when you can define the modules and also the dynamic part when you define services and how modules operate together. So everything is, it, for, for the first time, it looks pretty nice and interesting. Unfortunately, SGS suffers a lot from a bad pay. Yeah, essentially, when you put SGI in the title of your talk, I'm sure you won't get accepted anywhere. I, I answered this, so now I know what to do. I had to just hide it in the abstract. That is, you have some chance. There, yeah, so this is, of course, uh, ThoughtWorks technology radar, and this is the IGI part. It's, it's here for many, many editions. So why OSJ is suffering from bad fame? Partially, it's well deserved, because there are a lot of problems, mostly because of the vicious circle because SGI doesn't have too wide adoption, so the library authors don't want to accept, for example, pull requests to, to make their libraries modules in, in the sense of OSGI, and then because their libraries, notably Hibernate and stuff like that, are not ready for SGI, then nobody wants to use OSGI, so it suffers from poor adoption and so on. And so on. Also, the tooling is kind of subpar, it's getting better and better both, so you, if you looked at OSGI like five years ago, now it's much, much better, I assure you. And there's BND for defined modules. There are some plugins for XNIPS and IntelliJ, although I haven't ever made them work, but still. And the Maven tooling is also quite nice. I believe that if you try with SBT or Gradle, probably you will encounter some problems. So it's kind of workable. 
low, you need some effort. So, now I'm going to tell you a slightly, slightly a bit about SGI and why do we came to, to the conclusion that maybe it's not that bad, maybe it somewhat fits our purpose. So what about the study? By the way, how many of you know SGI, more or less? Oh. So, so if you know, then probably you won't learn too much new things, but maybe, who knows. So the static part, what is the module sense of SGI? Well, essentially it's a jar file with some additional headers defining what, what capabilities do, does the bundle of the jar file offer and what, what other modules does it need. And also <laughs> the, uh, the metadata define the version, versioning hell, I would say. Because versioning is hard, right? This is kind of typical SGI manifest. For sure, you don't, don't worry, you don't have to write it by hand. There are some tools like Maven plugin that uh, let you define it more easily. So this is, the most two important parts are here. Here we define what packages are the API of this bundle, what are the uh, public API of the bundle, and what are the private parts. So here we say that this bundle mm, offers API that's this package with this version, and to run it needs it needs these packages uh, it needs these packages with with certain version range, right? So it looks not too bad, but the thing is that you know versioning is hard, and it's I believe that it's not accidental complexity of the GI. Just versioning is hard, and if you if you think about how does REST or, or microservices do with versioning, it's like kind of best effort. If you can and if you follow conventions, then the versioning will somewhat work. This is kind of, you know, quadrant of doom of, of versions. But, but, but if you think about how, how, how to version REST services, then you come to the conclusion that you, if you don't follow with, with great discipline the conventions, then you may end up with kind of, well, not too nice place. I know because I kind of been there, like, after seven years of development and no strict versioning policies, you know, you, you end up with intentional mess. So versioning is hard and I just make this fact explicit, right? While we all this dynamic contract set, contract based testing and stuff like that, just make it in, implicit and you just won't notice it until, until it breaks and blow in your face. Right, so it more or less looks like this. There's the, our service bundle that, let's say, offers some business capability. It publishes some API, there's another service. Everything is running in one OSGI container. And they, are, mm, they can use some common libraries. So for real microservices, it would look like this. There's one microservice, another microservice, and here's, there's some implicit API. Here this API is just some Java interfaces. And here is God knows what. For example, some AP man, Swagger, documented API that nobody knows about. Fortunately, there is a cheat mode in SGI. Because one of the biggest problems with SGI is mm, library support. And you can essentially, fortunately, embed libraries that doesn't have OSGI structure in your bundle and treat it like kind of private part. So this is kind of kind of cheating, but sometimes it's the only way to go with SGI. So that's more or less all I wanted to say about the static part. It, it works and it makes your versioning problems explicit, but you have to cope with it to use it, but there's also dynamic part. I, I think it's kind of often forgotten because people just stuck up on the module definition part, but it has many nice gems. For example, uh, it defines microservices, but written in this way. And in fact, the guys from OSGI used the term just like 10 years ago. And it works, it, it really works. How, how, how do you use it? Well, it's, again, this is the, the inside of OSGI container. You publish some API, you, you declare that your bundle publishes some service, and you publish it into some internal registry, and another bundle may use it using the API. There are some discovery mechanisms, there are a lot, a lot of hooks that can 
uh, let you modify the, the, the way this discovery mechanism works. But I want to show you the, <laughs> the API from the standard SGI because your eyes would hurt. It's low level API and I, I wouldn't encourage you to, to use it just by hand, but there are a few frameworks that let you use it in kind of more sane way. One, one of these is Blueprint, which is kind of OSGI standard, and there's also declarative services. And today, if you were in Jean Papi's talk about Caraf, then you know that also in Caraf you can use, which is also kind of OSGI container on steroids, you can use uh, CDI annotations, which is really pretty cool. So, <laughs> but your eyes will hurt. So this is the blueprint. If, if, you, if you have like, I don't know, five, seven years experience, this may remind you of something. What is it? Spring 2, right. So yeah, they, yeah. it's kind of old, old stylish, but it works. It's almost the spring with different namespaces, but you see this is significant difference. Here you define uh, kind of <coughs> mm, dependencies between these blueprint contexts. Because in Spring, when you have either with XML of, or annotations, when you have like, I don't know, 10 jars, each of them defining a few, few, few beans, then it, and you put it into one Spring application, it all ends up with, in one big bag of beans. And here you can define this bin is a private part of your microservice. And here, for this to work, to boot, you need to be provisioned with data source named like this. And also there are annotations that let you expose services to other bundles. So this is pretty interesting that you can mm, decompose your beans into private and, uh, and public part. But there's also fortunately <laughs> more annotation based frameworks like mm, declarative services. This more or less looks like more modern Spring. Of course, uh, there are mm, subtle differences. For example, these annotations will, won't be read in runtime, but you have to plug some crazy Maven plugin that you generate your XML descriptions of that. But but in, uh, at the code level, it looks pretty nice. So again, we define it's a component, so it's kind of a being, and we define that it exposes this interface as its service. So it's you know just normal programming model. It's not so so different to to, to normal Spring applications or CDI. But what makes it OSGI different is the lifecycle. In normal Spring, for example, CDI applications, uh, everything is initialized at the start. And then it just runs. But in OSGI, you can deploy code, code in the runtime, just like with uh, Eclipse plugins. You can uh, you can install new Eclipse plugin, and you know the Eclipse still runs, but the plugin works. So the life cycle of OSGI service is much more complicated. We can you can do hot swap, you can start and stop services, which is actually pretty cool. For example, on our platform, we have some solutions that let you stop some capabilities based on mm, based uh, through, through, through some JMX switches to let you perform some kind of maintenance. And for example, then some services or uh, schedulers won't work. So you can work safely. So again, this is kind, kind of uh, nicely um, done with, 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 with the this is, for example, declarative services annotations. You just annotate your method to activate, or modify, or deactivate. And these methods are called when you, <laughs> when your service is by is stopped or started or modified by some management interface. We'll talk about it a bit later. But you know, it's still more or less simple Java code that you can unit test. So it's pretty nice. Also, there's. Mm, the part that is also forgotten in SGI is the configuration admin specification. Like uh, in the last talk, we've heard that guys, you know, develop their own configuration mechanism. Netflix has also some, uh, how is it called, archives platforms to let you dynamically uh, reconfigure services. And in SGI is just there for like, I don't know, more than 10 years. It's based, of course, on properties, not YAML and so on. But you know, you can stick with properties and, and 
No, there are quite nice solutions using the app. It can be file baked, but also it you the configuration can be read by Zookeeper. And most importantly, all the services can be dynamically updated and be notified that the configuration changed. So it looks like this. Again, it's kind of simple Java interface. You annotate your method with uh, you, your methods in your bin with modify or activate, and then you are just uh, notified that the configuration changed. You just read, the, you just get new map of, of, of properties, and you can react. For example, you can you know change the um, properties of database connection pool, or you can adjust I don't know subject of email message that you send to your clients, and no need to restart anything. So this is, in my opinion, this is pretty nice. And if it had Netflix back on it, then I'm sure it would be more widely used. But it does, so yeah, it's also forgotten. So more or less, it looks like this: the service, service registry, and so on. And how does it look in microservices? More or less like this: there's API, one microservice, second microservice. And there's some registry based on Zookeeper, uh, etcd, or anything more fancy than that. Because uh, I recently figured out that Zookeeper is also becoming old-fashioned, and people move on and move on and move on. Come on! And we are just introducing Zookeeper and treat it as some kind of novelty. But well, life goes on. But uh, soon you reach a point that. Uh, you cannot put all your services into one SGI container because it's too big, it's too fragile, and so on. And you, <laughs> in fact, you don't want to end up with some great big monolith. So what do you do? Well, you is use dynamic SGI. That's kind of a tricky part, but it has some nice implementation developed by guys at Red Hat who, unfortunately, are not here, or by C uh, Apache Project, Project C. Excel. So basically, it amounts that the registry inside the SGI container just announces to, to the kind of global registry, usually, yeah, and made uh, using Zookeeper that this service is on this container and now the services from, from other containers can invoke it. And the mm, actual invocation. And the Zookeeper, of course, all, all, uh, only manages the discoverability of the services. And the actual invocations are done, can be done by JAXWS services or REST services, which made it look quite a lot like, um, like standard micro services using REST. Right? So again, it's not, not, so, not so different. Actually, it's pretty nice. Yeah, of course, you can made up with all the palaces of distributed computing, you can end up with next EJBs, so you have to worry what is, which, which invocations are local, which are global, because yeah, you, may end up, you may end up with chat interfaces, all these latency problems and so on. But if you take notice, then it's worked pretty well. And we use it in production and it works. Right, Bartek? Yeah. yeah. Bartek took care of our <laughs> latest product with respect to DSJ. What's even more nice is that you can defer your deployment decisions to the last moment. So at first, when you have a mm, small startup, you don't have too much traffic, you put everything into one SGI container, right? You develop, 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 you put everything in one container, and then when you figure out that you have Mm, bigger requirements in terms of high availability, in terms of, of scalability, you divide it, right? You put the registry, this is the SGI, you end up with one container containing this service, and for example, load balanced uh, two of these. And all this, all this change, is done without any change in code. This is, I think it's actually pretty cool because it's, you know, lean, agile, and so on. So you don't have to rewrite. Because this is what I find about mm, a bit more troubling in, in the normal Spring Boot microservices. That if, if you decide that you want to change the boundaries of the services, then you, it's probably not much, but you still need to change some code. And here it's just a matter of packaging and configuration when it works properly. But uh, yeah, you can, you can make it work properly. 
So now I word it to how much time do I have? Uh, counting, counting, counting. Ah, still quite of. Nah, that's good. That's quite a lot of time. Uh, now I word it to about tooling. So in our project we are using Apache Cara, a bit older version than Jean Baptiste uh, told about today, but still it works. So for those of you who didn't attend his speech, it's kind of micro container based on SGI, but you, you can deploy many other applications there, for example, war files or anything like that. So it has, apart from being a SGI container, it has some different capabilities, like nice uh, SSH console, quite nice logging configuration, different mechanism of provisioning, deployment, and also it supports some um, additional OSGI specifications like blueprint transactions, JBC. So it's really quite nicely fully fledged uh, micro container. Uh, I think it's not worse than all those Spring anything, uh, Spring anything novelties like Spring Boot or anything like that. It does the job. It's pretty stable and what's more is Apache project. So this is, I don't have demo because yeah, it's, it's too late for that. But we are, these are some screenshots. So this is the SSH console of Cara. You can just SSH to, to the server and do some, yeah, so do some maintenance task. So you don't have to open some new management ports. You just use SSH. That's pretty nice. And also, we are using uh, Hout.io. This is the web application to control different, different containers based on JMX that uh, in the morning, James Strahan told you about, then Rob Davis told you about it, and Klaus Ibsen also showed it. So we're using kind of oldish version of it because we are essentially using uh, we are essentially using a older version of the Fabricate platform that was based on OSGI, right? Today the guys told you about the Kubernetes and all the goodies, but just half a year ago the Fabricate was based on the SGI and Carf, mostly. But they dropped the code and we were left with, with the older versions. But fortunately it's kind of working. Alright, so our containers are governed by, by the Fabricate, all the configurations in Captain Zookeeper and yeah, we, we have some nice, uh, nice UI to control the stuff. We have quite, we have also developed our own mm, plugins to, to the UI so that we can control the, all the platform and we can see if, if everything is okay and how, how did we configure our services. So this project is pretty interesting and even if you don't want to use microservices in OSGI spirit, then I can encourage you to, to look at it because it uses just JMX, which is kind of, I don't know, lingua franca of, of management. So once your container exposes some JMX API and every, everything exposes JMX API, you can just plug it in and use it with, with the Jilokia and how to help. Now, <laughs> the, the next part is about um, a, a bit more about work in progress because we are still using this old Fabricate version, but we are trying to, to, to pursue some <laughs> new goals and to, to, to uh, to tell our clients to move on to, to, to some better better world of uh, development. So yeah, so the thing is that we defined our modules, we defined our services and so on, but how to put them together? How to put them together if we don't have, you know, one main project uh, creating one old big fat jar? So the answer are the profiles. The profiles that uh, Jean-Baptiste told today uh, will, will come in care of uh, 4.0 and the profiles are just metadata that uh, tell how to build Caraf and, and the bundles that should be installed on it. How does it look like? Well, more or less like this. We define some hierarchical structure of, of metadata there's some inheritance mechanism and so on, and each of the each of the folders is <coughs> one profile that describes one I would say business capability, right? There's a multi inheritance, so you can reuse configurations and so on. And in each 
profile, you can define that you have some certain configurations in properties files that can describe which, which jars, which bundles will be installed as part of this profile and also some different, for example, business configurations like this uh, subject of a welcome email to the customer. So you organize it into one big repository of your metadata that describes how to assemble your artifacts and co configuration into runnable artifacts. You can also use these feature mechanism from CAR if you know uh, what they are, but, but, but it's made mainly the configuration files containing uh, description of bundles and versions and configuration. So what you do with it, you put it in Git. And of course, if, if you are conservative, you can put it in SVN. Don't mind. But we are using, for example, GitLab. These are the screenshots for our, from our real production uh, GitLab. You, you put it there, so you, you can have um, full accountability, you can have uh, the full history of changes of your configuration, and you know how to, for example, revert the change of configuration and stuff like that. So it works pretty nice. And then the flow is more or less like this. You have this metadata configuration in Git, you have your artifacts in, in for example, in Nexus. This, this is not your source code repository. This is the part when you already deployed your source code into the Nexus. And then, for example, you can have some Jenkins job that reads the profile description from the metadata, pulls the binaries from, from Nexus, and just assembles it into what? Into a pretty nice turbo that you can hand to your operation guys and send, tell them, OK, please uninstall it. Because they know what is Turbo, they know how to, you know, unpack it, start, stop. <coughs> it's just normal Java process, and you control, you or, or, or the development part of the client, uh, uh, control the assembling of, of of all your metadata and the code into into the into the, some runnable binaries. And because you have <laughs> Git, you have nice branching capabilities. Then you can also use it, for example, to, to be able to tell that in this branch uh, of our configuration, of our uh, metadata configuration, this commit will go to production and this will branch off because this is some nicely feature that we want to deploy only on test. And then you can use, because these are all uh, plain text files, you can use all the merging capabilities and the stuff that you know and like. To, to, to be able to control your metadata environment, yeah, your, your metadata repository. And this, I think this is, this is pretty nice and it lets you really control all these, not only, not only which binary is deployed on which server, but also what configuration do you use and why, when you look at the comment messages and so on. So, this is our more or less current setup. We use SGI, we use Caraf, we use Profiles, and we are kind of happy because, well, one thing is that we defer the decision to the last moment and you can decide if you want these services to be close together and have only, you know, local invocations or we want them to be separated and this is on one server, this is on another, and we don't have to change code to, to change the behavior. So, the code is separated from the deployment and you know, the Opsys guys don't have to know that much <laughs> how is it assembled. They just got one button more or less to, to, that tells them to deploy the stuff. And then they don't have to worry about the, all these Kubernetes business and stuff like that because probably in the future they will be able to cope with it, but now they won't. Now they have one single Java processes. Of course, there's some zookeeper part that is kind of more difficult, but they can cope with it. And it's also kind of important that it's built on standards. OSGI is here to stay, it won't go anywhere, right? Whereas with Spring Boot, all these Kubernetes, it's, it's kind of really unstable. If you, if you talk to the Red Hat guys, they'll tell you that the <coughs> innovation at Kubernetes is so fast that you know, breaking changes are quite often. And our client, well, kind of doesn't want to pay for that. And SGI is kind of, maybe it's not so great and fancy, but it's stable and usable. And so is it. So currently we have about around six virtual 
or even now with virtual but physical servers in two data centers with like like 31 containers mm, of Caref and like more than 200 profiles. So it's kind of not so small and will, it will grow larger and larger. For example, yesterday this slide uh, was written like 25 containers, but today I, I've noticed that six new containers came. So that's, uh, it's getting big quite fast. Um, but as Jack is, it's lit. And especially when it comes to resilience and fault tolerance. Mm -hmm. okay. Because this, this is the main reason that the SGI will fail oh, oh, in some critical parts. Like because the method thread stop is deprecated. You cannot, you cannot control resources, CPU and stuff in, inside the Java process. If there's some malbehaving thread, you cannot control it. You cannot kill it, right? If you have few microservices, you can kill Linux processes and everything runs as intended. But in Java, you have to kill the whole JVM. So that means that even if you package few of your services and they work more or less independently in one SGI container, then you still have to, you know, have some duplication, some load balancing, so that if you want to kill one container because of one microservice, then everything runs as, as intended. Also, the code home deploy is kind of mixed, mixed thing because during development it's pretty nice. It's almost like developing with JRebel because you only build your small, small modules that that they are pretty quick. You install them, you know, by some kind of live reload, and the services are is restarted, and you can observe changes. But in production, it may very well happen, like it happened to us one time, that in about half a year there was no uh, no restart of the server, just hot deployments, hot deployments. And then when the restart time came, it turned out that the bundle started some fancy, fancy way and we didn't control it anymore. So, I guess that we still want unmodifiable containers, that you don't want to hot deploy the code in production, but you want to, for each release, you want to build uh, the container with all the dependencies and all the services as one tarball and deploy it uh, just as a whole. But still, I think that many parts of the, of the premises of microservices can be achieved with SGI. So, the, the, the main thing that I want you to more or less <laughs> remember that just because nobody will grant you root access in the enterprise doesn't mean you, you can't have modular applications. <laughs> just you have to think about it a bit maybe more differently. And you, 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 all, you always have to find your own way. We are, I think, a bit kind of here. This is K2, of course, and this is, you know, the root series, so it, we have still kind of a long way to go, but, you know, everybody has to, to, to know his or her own way. So, thanks. Happy to that you If there are any questions, I, I will be around more or less. So now we can go to the party, right?